Sorry, boy. Those captains gotta teach his men what happens to those who walk crossing. Captain's gotta teach stuff! <laughs> Good afternoon from the Batcave. It is uh, April 19th. It's a Monday today, and I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the Gospels and their order of um, writing and publication. I had somebody ask me a question this weekend about which would be which was the first Gospel between Matthew and Mark, and that's a that's a pretty common question. And if you've um, gone to Bible college or seminary, typically you're going to come out with the answer that Mark was written first because that's what the scholars say. Um, that's what's been taught in most seminaries for uh, many years now. Um, but that's actually a pretty novel idea, and it's admittedly just a hypothesis. It's it's a bad hypothesis. I'm going to show why it's a, a bad hypothesis. It's an ignorant hypothesis. It essentially accuses the earliest writers of the church of just lying, and um, and it's it uh, on the basis that it is. Um, Put forward, most people don't realize the ramifications of that. Um, it, it actually promotes the idea that there, in the original gospel, there was no account of the resurrection. And now that theory and the people who believe in that theory, you got to remember when P Jesus told us not to be taken captive by um, knowledge falsely so called. Well, that's what a hypothesis is. A hypothesis is just a guess. And when you have people that build a, a, a guess or a hypothesis or a theory on top of another theory, you're getting into imagination land. You're not even dealing with reality at all. You're just, and that's why you have people dealing with, you know, multiverses and stuff right now, because they don't want to accept what the Bible teaches about God creating the heavens and the earth. And so they keep stacking theories and hypotheses on top of each other to make an alternative reality that makes sense based on their first wrong idea, which is that God didn't create the universe. Well, it's the same thing with uh, those people who were behind um, the Markin hypothesis. And if you've ever heard of the, the, the Q gospel, the supposed theoretical gospel that pre-existed um, Mark, um, that's, that's really a, a direct byproduct of the Markin theory. And so is the, the theory that the long ending of Mark should be taken off. And uh, if you take the long ending off of Mark, you have no account of the resurrection, which means you have no gospel. So this is this is serious stuff, and, and it's been building up for about um, about 250 years now. It's very, remember, the church is 2,000 years old. The theory of Mark being written first is only 250 years old. So we're going to get into the origin of that theory, and then we're going to get into the ramifications of that theory. But if you want to learn about this, Google the term Mark in priority, and uh, you're going to figure out that all, all the theory behind it. Um, and this is a theory... Um, Remember, up, in, up until uh, the 18th century, so this is 1786 is when this theory was invented, everybody held the, um, the testimony of the church fathers, which were essentially the people who wrote prior to the Council of Nicaea. So between the apostles themselves and the Council of Nicaea, their, their writings aren't scripture, they aren't authoritative, but there are many people who, who either knew one of the apostles or knew somebody that knew one of the apostles, and this tradition was handed down pretty early. So um, that's what everybody believed until this guy came up with a theory. Uh, his name is Gottlieb Christian Storr. Um, he was born in Germany, and if you know anything about Germany, they like to philosophize a lot there. And Stuttgart was where um, Hegel came from. It's a you know kind of a hotbed for secular philosophy, and it's also a hotbed for textual criticism. The idea that um, we need to keep uh, refining the Bible text to get down to its original, and what they always end up doing, if you read a book on textual criticism, one of the biggest criticisms of textual criticism is they, they approach the manuscripts with the assumption that whatever is the shorter version of what is written is probably the more accurate. Now, there's no real science to come up with that assumption. They just theorize that, well, a person's more likely to add a word here and there to clarify something than forget to write a word when they're copying. So they just theorize then if there's a shorter manuscript between the two, if one says the, the the dog ran to the east and the other one said the dog ran east, they assume that the dog ran east is is the better writing because to the east is is something that somebody could have written in after the fact. And then of course they're going to translate these into their own language and they're going to write back in the dog ran to the east, but they're going to say that the original said just the dog ran east. Well, they don't really know that. And you, what you find is that their, um, their theories are weighted not on what the majority of manuscripts that we have, but what manuscripts they assume are the oldest. And the ones that they assume are older than any are these, they're called the Textus Sinaiticus. 
which was strangely discovered by this this guy in the 18th century under really strange circumstances and i'm not entirely convinced i'm not convinced at all that it's not a forgery they could prove right away whether or not it's a forgery by doing a test of the the ink and the parchment and doing all the carbon dating and the materials testing that they have done with a number of manuscripts but they refuse to do it this uh this manuscript is enshrined in england it used to be enshrined in russia um, and they just say this is how old we believe it is and they based it on this textual critical theory rather than on dating the actual materials that the parchment and inks are made of so and then the other second oldest one which also isn't dated is the texas vaticanus which is um the vatican the roman catholics uh supposed oldest version so these two versions are heavily weighted and basically they're treated like a standard by which to measure the other texts even though um we have what's called the majority text family or the byzantine text family which uh, came from the region uh, that John the Apostle, the last apostle, died in. And uh, basically between the region of Ephesus and Antioch, that's where the, these, these texts were mostly copied in from, and that's where the majority of them took place. And uh, there's these theories that pop up that essentially the original handwriting was inspired, but if anyone were to add any words to clarify something, those words would not be inspired. Well, that theory falls apart if you just know your Old Testament, because you'll know that they did that with the Old Testament, too. For instance, in the book of Genesis, when Abraham is chasing the armies that um, captured Lot, it says he chased them as far as Dan. Well, the city that they chased him to was a city called Laish or Lashem, and it wasn't called Dan for about a thousand years later. And we know that Moses wrote the book of Genesis, and it wasn't called uh, Dan until the book of Joshua after Moses was dead. So we know that somebody went back in and changed it to clarify the location with the name of the city that the reader would have in mind. Because after that first uh, generation, when Joshua conquered the promised land, that, that city was renamed Dan because a bunch of Danites sacked it. And uh, everybody in Israel who would be reading that Bible would know that that city is called Dan. So whoever that that scribe was maybe it was samuel maybe it was ezra we don't know they changed the name to dan to make it make sense we also know that um way back in the book of genesis when they're doing the table of nations they mark the nation from where the philistines come from long before the philistines existed as a people um we know that uh you know somebody wrote in after moses died that god buried moses after he died which is something obviously they believed in their tradition obviously nobody saw because it says right in it that nobody saw where god buried him but god buried him so somebody after Moses died would have had to have written that in. So obviously it's still inspired, despite the fact that it's been edited. And we can see this through the book of Chronicles. We can see this in various books of Kings, that there are other books that they're drawing from. And we don't have those original books. And yet what they pulled out of them, we believe is inspired. So um, there's some theories about inspiration that I don't quite agree with. And I think uh, what it means that, that something is in spirit, it means the spirit of God is moving upon this person to do this. Now, God might move upon me to prophecy, let's say, but I might choose the words. Does that mean, you know, the exact words I chose were, were inspired? Or does that mean what I said, the meaning of what I said was inspired? And somebody could say what I said in slightly different words, but with the same meaning. And that's also inspired because it's the same thing. Well, we have perfect examples of this in the New Testament because there are things that are said differently in the Masoretic Hebrew text that are said in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of that Hebrew text, because there are certain idioms and figures of speech that might not carry over from the Hebrew to the Greek or from the Hebrew to the English. But the meaning of what they're getting across does carry over, and that is still inspired. And we don't really have a problem with that in translation, but when people get down to the Greek manuscripts, they think if any, any additions were made to the Greek text, for instance, they mostly do this with the New Testament, that those those additions would be uninspired so um you know there could be little lines like a line in john where it says the the passover was nigh at hand which means the passover was near to when this event happened and of course that note if it probably was an additional note that somebody added in but it became copied part of the text clarify where you were in the timeline of jesus's ministry but it wasn't in the original of john well what if john wrote his gospel and then somebody copied it and said, I'm going to clarify that this is right here. And John was right there. And he said, okay, we don't know that. We don't know that John was okay with that. We don't know if John wasn't. But the point is, 
it, it clarified the meaning of the text, and it certainly doesn't change any doctrines or anything, so why do we take it out? And the answer is we shouldn't. The majority of the Bibles for the majority of time have always had that in that. Same thing with things like the Compendium Adultery, which is the story of the woman caught in adultery in John. We know, based on manuscript evidence, that that wasn't in the original that John wrote, but it was actually in Luke's writings. Well, if you know Luke's writings, you know that Luke wrote um, basically a chronological series of events, and this event happened at the Feast of Tabernacles, which Luke writes nothing about. However, John wrote about the Feast of Tabernacles, where this event takes place. So we got to remember that John was alive for 30 years after Luke was written. Somebody could have easily approached John and said, John, when did this story take place? And he said, oh, that was at the Feast of Tabernacles. And so they inserted it in John. But John lived 10 years after John was, was written. So John could, there could have been hundreds of copies of, of the Gospel of John floating around when John decided to tell somebody that took place at this time. And they inserted it in with John's authorization. But now you've got hundreds of manuscripts that are getting copied off of something without that. And then you're getting all these other manuscripts that are getting copied with that. Well, we don't know for certain whether or not John gave a specific authorization to put that in there. But if we don't believe that, or we don't believe that any of the other people did, were, were authorized by God to do so, then the only thing that remains is that there's a false story in the Bible that we don't know whether or not it's true or should even be in the Bible. Well, if you know biblical inspiration and you know typology and you just know the word of God, you should know the compendium adultery belongs in there. That story fits perfectly in with the theme of John. It fits perfectly in with the heart of Jesus's ministry. It, I couldn't imagine a Bible without that story. Now, likewise, what you have at the end of the book of Mark is you have Mark ending abruptly with no uh, account of the resurrection, which is strange. Because based on all the earliest accounts, Mark was a, a record of what Peter preached orally in Rome. And why would Peter preach in Rome and then not talk about seeing the resurrected Christ when he was the first one to go look at the tomb with John after it was empty when the women reported it empty? And he saw Jesus resurrected multiple times. Why wouldn't he report that? Well, there's a simple answer to that that most people don't consider. You see, Peter was killed in Rome. And nobody ever considers the possibility that maybe Peter was killed before he got to finish his testimony. Maybe he, he, he was speaking the story of what he remembers. And then because he was killed, we don't hear what Peter actually saw at the end. Consequently, we do hear what Peter saw at the end from the Gospel of John, because John gives us a lot of details about things that happen between Peter and Christ after the resurrection. So apparently, Peter didn't get to finish his testimony, and God inspired John to finish it for him. But what we do, ha we do know from ancient history is that uh, a guy named Aristion, who was one of the 70 apostles that were sent out after the 12 by Jesus, finished the Gospel of Mark and added the long ending so that it would be a legitimate gospel with an account of the resurrection. And so we know that the long ending of Mark is legitimate and it has an apostolic source. Aristion was, was called one of the elders and those were the 70 other people that were sent out with power and authority to cast out demons by Jesus. And that is that account is um, in the notes of the Armenian version of that Bible, which if you know anything about Armenia, Armenia is where Andrew, Peter's brother, preached. And so, if anyone might know whether or not this is Peter's gospel handed by Mark, do you think it might be Andrew, Peter's brother? And of course, Andrew and John were the first two of Jesus' disciples. So you have Andrew preaching in Armenia and John preaching in Ephesus. And then Armenia becomes the first kingdom that becomes a, uh, a Christian nation. And so they have a lot of ancient writings from the earliest parts of the church that a lot of us don't have. Well, we want to talk about this theory where it originated. Um, so here's the new theory. And again, this is this is this guy, Gottlieb Conrad, Christian Store, comes up with this theory. It doesn't say exactly when he came up with the theory, but the guy who came up with the theory, and this is ironic, this is another one of his famous students was George Wilhelm Friedrich, Friedrich Hegel. So if you've ever heard of the Hegelian dialectic, if you study philosophy, this is a very popular theory among conspiracy theorists. That was a student of this guy. So the guy who came up with a marking priority was, was the teacher to the guy who came up with the Hegelian dialectic. And his students came up with Marxism. So right here, you've already got something kind of not too 
awesome fruit coming through this guy. Now, I'm not saying he inspired this, but he comes up with this mark and priority because this was this is what the Germans would do is they would come up with theories and those theories would become more prominent than the facts when it came to the scriptures. So he starts teaching this theory and this theory is, uh, eventually took hold and now it's taught in most seminaries that Mark was written first. And what the Mark and priority has now evolved into is this idea that first it was that Mark was written first. And it's not just that Mark was written first. It's that Mark was written first and Matthew and Luke were not separate gospels written by other eyewitnesses, but they were actually embellished from Mark. So in other words, the theory is not just that Mark was written first, but that Matthew just took Mark and then added some more to it. And Luke took Mark and added some more to it. And it's kind of like um, how a legend would grow, where the, the, the story of John Henry keeps getting bigger and bigger until, you know, John Henry could, you know, work faster than a jackhammer or whatever. Like Davy Crockett could you know, put two uh, rifle slugs on top of above another and he killed him a bar when he was only three. Well, that's how they're kind of proposing that the Gospels developed. And so they have this theory here that Mark was written, and of course the long ending of Mark was illegitimate, so Mark was written with no account of the resurrection, and then Matthew was written after that with an account of the resurrection, and that theory evolved over time. The same people that say this says Mark was not written by an eyewitness, nor was it written by Mark who's in the book of Acts. Matthew was not written by Matthew. Luke was not written by Luke, but these were written by people after the fact, they believe after the first century, and this is what I was taught in a secular university. This is what they believe, that these were all written probably after 100 AD. And Mark was the early, earliest version, and like legends grow, it grew into Matthew and Luke over time. Well, they have a problem with this theory because as they take this theory to task and try to sort it out, they have a real problem. The, the problem is, is that there's things in the book of Mark that aren't in Matthew or Luke. So if these were copies of Mark that were expounded upon, you need to come up with reasons why the stuff that's in Mark is not in those. And this is what they do. Now they come up with this theory of this Q gospel. And the Q gospel theory was that there was some gospel that existed before Mark that had even less than Mark had in it. And Matthew and Luke, the things that are different from Mark, were, were copied from this gospel and the things that Mark has that were different were, were added to this Q gospel. And so what they're basically saying is none of us have an original gospel. None of us have a gospel by eyewitnesses, but what the eyewitnesses wrote doesn't exist anymore. It's just a theory. And then all these were copied and embellished upon this Q gospel. This is the, this is the prevailing theory now. So make sure you understand what, what your, your textual critical scholars and your, um, your theorists and your philosophers are telling you now. They're telling you, we don't have the original gospel. Whatever was in it was less than what is in uh, the gospel of Mark or Matthew or Luke, and it doesn't contain a resurrection. What they're saying is there's no gospel. That, that Jesus Christ's resurrection was a myth. And it all started with this Mark and priority theory. Well, why did they prioritize the idea that Mark was, was the original? And the answer is because it's shorter. They, they started with this assumption that a shorter story or a shorter version of a saying is more likely accurate. Why? I mean, think about it. If you're repeating something somebody else said, are you more likely going to shorten it to summarize what they said? Or are you more likely to say verbatim exactly what they said? And the answer is you're more likely gonna shorten it. You're gonna paraphrase it into something shorter and quicker to say. You're not gonna repeat every last word they said. But they assume that Mark is, because it's shorter, it's, it's the more accurate one. And so they start with this theory that doesn't add up and that, that has added to an idea of a false gospel. Well, there are actually people who are now putting out this Q gospel and this is a false gospel. It's called the Q source. And people are putting out this Q source as if it were a real gospel. And now there are people who are putting it out as a publication, as if this is what the original gospel says. And so they have all the, these things, which is, you know, again, they call it the gospel of Q. 
And of course, where do you have it? Well, you have it with the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Judas, and all the other Gnostic Gospels. This is a Gnostic Gospel. And this Gospel was born completely out of a, a theory of a process of eliminating everything that they don't have in Matthew, Mark, and Luke all together. And so what they say is Matthew, Mark, and Luke were all based on this original source that only had this much in it. And look, look how short this is. If I were to print this onto a PDF format, it would be just nine pages long. The Gospel of Mark, printed in the same similar format, would be about 30 pages long. If it's printed in my format that I printed in, which is pretty compact, it's 23 pages long. But what they're saying is the original gospel was just nine pages long. Um, if you look carefully at it, what you will find is no miracles. It doesn't end with a resurrection. It ends with him telling him that, that the, the 12 apostles will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. It's just a list of sayings that take out all the miracles and they take out the resurrection and that they say that was the original gospel. And then from that, eventually someone wrote Mark, probably with this was, they think this is the eyewitnesses gospel of his sayings. And then Mark was written probably around 100 AD. And then after that, Matthew was written. And after that, Luke was written. So if you really know the fullness of what this theory is saying, they're saying there is no gospel. There is no resurrection. This is all heresy. This is all Gnostic. It's all false gospel. But Gnosticism has been disguising itself as biblical scholarship for years. For instance, if you know who Nestle Aland are, all your modern Bibles, your ESV, your NIV, your New American Standard, they're all based on this Nestle Aland's Novum Testamentum Grasse, which is essentially the New Testament Greek, okay? And these guys carried out similar scholarship on the Gospels, and they decided which, which belonged to the, the, the original and which didn't. And they keep coming up with a new book, like every four years, saying, well, we've, we've found out some new changes that we need to make. And every four years, they come up with a new Gospel. So if you're a fan of the ESB Bible, you need to know that the ESB Bible came out in... 2001. The ESV Bible is an updated version of the Revised Standard Edition, and, and, and among especially your Reformed Calvinist-leaning um, people and a lot of Baptists and a lot of churches, they've been working really hard to make this the most popular Bible in English. They call it the English Standard Bible. It's not. It's really just a uh, an update of the Revised Standard Version, which was made in 1885, which was meant to replace the King James with a Bible that's based on this modern textual scholarship. Well, the Revised Standard Edition, the second edition, was in 1971. And then they stopped making new editions of it, and they started making the ESV in 2001. And they say the, the, the ESV is the English Standard most accurate translation of the best textual criti critical scholarship. That's what they say. So if it's so good, why have they changed it five times? See, the ESV is now on its... Fourth edition. They also have a Roman Catholic Augustine edition. Um, they they came out in, in two thousand one. They they so I'm sorry they they've changed it four times. So so now in two thousand seven they came out with another one, and they said made they made minor minor uh, changes to the text. Then in twenty eleven, they changed. Um, fewer than 500 words. Well, 500 words is a lot of words. Your, your New Testament is only a couple hundred pages long. So to change 500 words, that's a lot. Um, and then it says 275 from the two, uh, 2007 text. And uh, these changes were made without even telling people that they are made. It said they were made in each case to correct grammar, improve consistency, or increase precision in meaning. Okay. Well, if they had all these years to come out with it, remember these these textual uh, manuscripts, these critical textual man manuscripts, that process has been going on since the 1800s. So why, if they've had over 100 years to come up with the perfect English Bible, have they had to change it so quickly? And then, of course, when they when they made these change, changes, they didn't even tell people they made them. They just made them. Now, if I do that, and I'm just some guy who's publishing and saying, hey, this is my, my version of the Texas Receptus Creed. I made it, and I published a new edition. I just put second edition on it. I'm done, okay? I'm just a guy. I'm not trying to make my 
my interpretation or translation, the standard Bible for everybody else. It's my own personal pet project. I'm trying to translate this in my own understanding as best as I can. It's a personal project. Somebody else can buy it if they want to. Somebody else can buy it and change it if they want to. I don't care. Um, I'm not trying to be a standard for churches out there, okay? But then in 2016, they came out with another edition that said it's the ESV permanent text edition. Well, what does that mean? It means we're not going to change it anymore. We're quite certain now this is the best possible English translation of this. Well, they are going to change it because there's going to be another Nestle Elan text coming out in 2028, and they're going to change it again. And they've already admitted that they're no longer going to hold to that um, promise to not change it anymore. So you need to ask yourself, well, why does your why does your Bible keep changing every year? Well, it doesn't change every year. It changes about every four years. That's why you see 2007, 2011, 2016. It's four years, five years apart. Well, here's why. Nestle Aland has been writing this New Testament Greek, and they're on edition 28. 28 editions of this, okay? So the first edition they came out with was 1898. So since 1898, do a little math here, 2021 minus 1898, you have 123 years. Well, let's divide that by 28 because they're on the 28th version. Every 4.3 years, they come out with a new Nestle Elan, a new best critical manuscript of the original Greek of the New Testament. And why is that? And I'll tell you why. Because every single seminary class that starts every four years starts with a brand new version of the original Greek, which means if you graduated before that, well, you got to get the next edition because you don't have the latest and greatest Greek manuscript. So they've been doing this for 120 years now. They've been telling people, well, you got to go back. So imagine if you imagine if you graduated from seminary 50 years ago and you're a 70 year old pastor and you're still teaching. Well, what's 50 divided by four? Well, that's 12. You would have had to have bought this book 12 times because you got to get the latest updates. You got to know what the original Greek says, because apparently you didn't know from the last 11 editions that you bought. You need the real Bible. And they keep doing this and they're going to do it every year until eternity because there's a lot of money in it. So the Nestle Elan 29, I'm sorry, they're on 29 now. But the 28, if I want to buy a copy of it, well, that's $67. So if I bought this 11 times, well, they made $700 on me. So think about that. They just keep making money on these students over and over and over again. The new Bible students, the universities, the seminaries, the pastors, they just keep making money on them over and over. And of course, by the time you get the new edition, well, what's the old edition worth? Well, the answer is nothing. Let's see. Well, we'll give you this one for $8. And from that, they have the um, UBS, which is, um, I believe it's, that stands for Universal Bible Standard, 5th Revised Greek New Testament. And uh, this is also what your uh, Wycliffe Bible Society uses. So they have all these different versions of this that you can get. But guess what? They're all worthless because only the latest and greatest is worth anything. But all these other versions, well, those are just basically collectible items that you can get for a few bucks. And they're worthless. It's like It's like an old college textbook once the new version comes out. Worthless. You pay 200 bucks for that book, but it's worthless. And that's all this is. It's just a new college textbook. Just going over the same BS to try to convince you to have doubt in what the Greeks said in the last one and need to go buy the latest and greatest to feel confident in your preaching. That's the game. And there's a lot of money in that game. Meanwhile, we have what's called the majority text uh, edition, which is most closely resembled in the King James in English, but this is the Byzantine text type and the majority text. And if you were to go to a church in India or Armenia or Russia or Assyria or most places in Europe, you would have some, some form of the Bible that's based on this Greek because that's what the majority of the churches use for the majority of the church's history. 
But these textual scholars have been around for about 120 years convincing the whole church that what they believed for, for 1,800 years was not good. And they need you to tell them what to really think about the Bible. Okay? So we're going to get back now to this Christian store guy who comes up with this theory. Well, well, what's his evidence for Mark being written first? And let's just read his evidence. Let's see what he says. His arguments for a Mark and priority are usually made in contrast to its main rival, the Matthean priority. Okay, and so they're, they're suggesting that these two theories are the main competing theories. Well, that's not true. They're not main competing theories. The idea that Matthew was first is what we've known since the apostles. And I'm going to prove that to you. Okay. And up until this guy came up with this theory to com compete with this fact, everybody knew that Matthew was first. That's why every Bible has Matthew first in the New Testament. Matthew was written before anything else was written in the New Testament, followed by Mark, followed by Luke, followed by John. Okay. They were published in exactly that order. Okay. Now, Acts obviously came with Luke, but the Gospels were first for a reason. Acts came right after the Gospels for a reason. And then the the um, the uh, the epistles started with Romans for a thematic reason. And, it, and all the Gentile epistles were, were bunched together first, while all the, what they called the Hebrew epistles, written um, by Peter, James, John, and Jude, who were considered the apostles to the Hebrews, where Paul was to the Gentiles, well, those were listed second. And the reason is, is because when the Bible became began to be compiled as a single manuscript, well, the Roman Empire had adopted Christianity as its religion, and the Roman em Empire was largely responsible for these compilations of the Bible in one big, thick book. Now, we had these scriptures, and I'm going to show you uh, witnesses from really within within 10 to 70 years after after John the Apostle died, that all agreed when they were written and which books were in the Bible. We had that agreement. But the idea of having it in one book, which we would call the canon or the Bible, um, was something that kind of started once it became adopted as the national religion of Rome. And so naturally, they want to prioritize Romans being first because it's the Romans' nat national religion now. And so... That's what you have going on, and um, you have these two these two um, disagreements now in the 1800s of, uh, over whether Matthew or Mark was first. Well, it says many lines of evidence point to Mark having some sort of special place in relationship among the synoptics as the middle term between Matthew and Luke, but this could mean that Mark is the common source of the other two, priority, or that it derives from both posterity. So, in other words. The theory is, is that because Matthew, because Mark is in between Matthew and Luke, that either means that Matthew and Luke were built off of Mark or Mark was built off of Matthew and Luke. Well, why? Does that, wh why does that need to be? And the answer is it doesn't need to be. It's just philosophers like to come up with new theories because that's how they sell books. That's how they get famous. So it says, or even that it is an intermediary in transmission from one to the other. In other words, many such arguments can support both, both Mark and priority and its rivals. Famously so-called the Lachman fallacy concerning the order of the Pericope and Mark was once used to argue for a Mark and priority, but is now seen largely as a neutral opposition. opposition. Modern arguments for or against the Mark and priority tend to center on redactional plausibility, what does that mean? It means redaction means to cut out or, or reduce in a writing. Um, plausibility, asking for example, whether it is more reasonable that Matthew and Mark could have written as they did with Mark in hand, or that Mark could have written as he did with Matthew and Luke in hand, or whether any coherent rationale can be discerned underlying the redactional activity of the later evangelist. What does that mean? I'm gonna tell you what that means. They don't believe that Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written by different people based on the same truth that was observed in Christ's ministry. They insist that they were written on the basis of one or the other. So in other words, maybe somebody added some details that they knew about Jesus to Mark, or that they subtracted some details that they didn't like about Mark, or that they 
invented some stories after the book of Mark to make it sound better. But what they don't believe is that, you know, Luke, Luke wrote Luke based on collecting eyewitness testimony, just like Luke says. And he had nothing to do with Mark. He didn't even look at Mark. And the stuff that they happen to agree on, that's because that was what was actually said almost verbatim. And that's why they sound so similar. Or that Matthew and Luke seem so similar because, well, Matthew hung out with Peter and the apostles all got together to write Matthew. And then Mark was recited by Peter, who had probably read Matthew over and over and over again. And he just recited what he heard in Matthew over and over and over again, plus adding some additional details from his own personal memory. Well, does that sound so crazy? Because that's actually what the church tradition says happened. And I'm going to show you that in a bit. But these guys don't believe that. Why? Because they don't believe the church tradition is valid on anything. They don't believe the ancient witnesses. And the reason you'll find out is because these guys don't trust the early church tradition. They don't trust the canon. A lot of them don't believe in the resurrection. And a lot of them are obsessed with Gnosticism. So if you get into uh, Nestle Aland. Why is this called Nestle Alon? Well, this because there's 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 two guys who wrote it. Their names were Nestle and Alon. And one of them was married to a woman. So this is Kurt Alon. That's who Alon is. And his partner was this guy, Nestle. And Nestle and Alon are, are the authorities, essentially, on what belong in the New Greek New Testament. Now, they're, they're dead now, so there's a school of critical thought that started with them, so it's based on their theories. But the guy who started this, Kurt Alon, the first question you want to know is, was he a believer? And you can find out that Kurt Alon was an ordained minister in the parish of Berlin Stiglat. So he was, he was apparently an ordained minister in a, maybe a Lutheran or Catholic church. And uh, he was one. He was once an ordained minor, minister in a church, and then he he was married and had three kids with a woman named Ingeborg Alon. But in 1972, we don't know if he divorced her or she died. He married Barbara Alon. Well, who's Barbara Alon? That's a very important question. Barbara was a professor of New Testament research and church history at the Westphalian Wilhelms University of Munster in Germany. Okay. Her doctorate was in Gnosticism. And, and Barbara Alon, who was instrumental in writing some of the later versions of the, um, she was instrumental in writing uh, some of the later versions of this uh, New Testament Greek, got her doctorate in Syrian Gnosticism. So, you know, the question kind of remains like, well, were these people believers or were they just scholars of literature? And did they hold the Bible in higher reverence than they did these Syrian Gnostic manuscripts? Or were they all just transmission of information to them? They are all just equal in value. And, and, and were they using, you know, these, these documents to help them um, form their beliefs on what they believed about what the Bible said and meant? And we don't really know that. All we know is every four years it keeps tra changing. And this woman was involved with that because she married the guy who was in charge of it. And so she was involved from the 70s to the 90s. We don't know. So again, we have a lot of theory. We have a lot of misinformation or things that we don't adequately know. I don't want an unbeliever touching my Bible and telling me what it ought to say and should say. Because that person's not going to have the fear of God. That person might have a theory. I might have a good theory on you know what the Bible should say or how it should be interpreted here. But what I do have is the fear of God. See, I fear the consequences if I mistranslate it. Even if it's in my own personal publication that I did, this is my version of the, of the New Testament, which I'm putting out. I still fear God in what I'm doing. Because I'm going to I'm gonna heavily notate that, hey, this is just my personal translation. I may have made mistakes. In fact, I'm sure I've made mistakes. Because the reason is, is because I'm letting people know this is my personal homework in going through the Greek and trying to translate it. Okay. But some guy might take that and just take it to the bank like this is what the true Bible ought to say and they might start using my New Testament as their Bible. Well, I want them to know if they're reading carefully that, hey, I am not a PhD Greek scholar. You know, I'm not saying this is better than all the rest. I'm not saying this is the standard. This is just my 
studies, basically. This is my study of the Greek, okay? And what it means in my best estimation. That's it. Um, and it's based on the Texas Receptus Greek, which the King James is based on, which not a lot of people try to modernize. So, so that's what I'm doing, okay? But, um, but you really want to dig into these people and figure out, because a lot of these people who are involved in this textual criticism did not believe in the resurrection, or they believed in unorthodox practices, or they um, were involved with Gnosticism and the occult. You, you want to figure this out, because a lot of these people were not necessarily born-again Christians with the fear of the Lord guiding their decision-making. Now, knowing that these people came up with these theories, and knowing that these theories are leading you to have a Bible that seems to need to change every few years. Are you sure that the Bible that you have is accurate? Because not only do you have all the changes that they make to the original Greek, but every time they interpret that into English, they read in what they think it ought to mean in a lot of these cases, and they change words around. I could I could do a whole video on the dozens and dozens of things that, that they change from the Greek. But we don't like that word regeneration there, so we're going to change that to the renewal of all things. But we don't like the word that it says um, that they would be to the praise of his glory who first believed. So we're going to change that to say that they would be to the praise of his glory who were the first to believe. Well, that sounds very different. One sounds like a condition of becoming to the praise of his glory, and the other one sounds like um, just the first people in order to believe. Which one's true? And you're going to find lots of these changes. Is is, are, there, are there eagles ga gathering carcasses in Luke 17 and Matthew 24? Or are there vultures gathering carcasses? Huge prophetic implications because one's quoting a prophecy from Jude and one's quoting a prophecy from Ezekiel. That means two very different things. One's talking about Armageddon and one's talking about a rapture. So you need to know what, what the original says. Now I, I know because I've done the study of the original Greek. But these are changes your average person doesn't catch. And then they go to Bible college and they hear, well, of course, Mark was written first and then Matthew and Luke were basically um, written based on Mark. And they say, okay, well, the scholarship says that Mark was written first, so Mark was written first. And they don't realize that scholarship is just a bunch of hypotheses and theories that assume that Matthew and Mark were created, or Matthew and Luke were created from Mark. Not just created after Mark, but from Mark. And that's different. Now you've got a telephone game going on. You've got a you, you've got this being a more true gospel and this, th these being less true gospels because they were made from Mark. Well, I've got this book here, and this is called The uh, Dictionary of Early Christian Beliefs. I found it at a bookstore for just 20 bucks. I thought, well, that's really cool. And it goes through all these different ancient church fathers and what they said about um, the books of the Bible and um, things that they heard from the apostles themselves. And... Um, in terms of the church fathers, you want to know these names pretty well. One of these guys is mentioned in the Bible, and the other three are not, but it was very well understood that these guys knew Peter, Paul, and John. Some one or two of them, some all three of them. Um, these, these four names are going to be Ignatius of Antioch. He was installed by Peter and John in Antioch as a bishop. Uh, another one is going to be Polycarp, who was installed by John as a bishop in Smyrna. Another one is Clement, who was installed as a bishop by Peter and, uh, and Paul, along with a guy named Linus, and they're both, their names are right in the Bible. And then another one is a guy named Papias, and Papias was a bishop in Hierapolis. And Hierapolis is right in the book of Colossians. And when Paul writes his letters to the Ephesians and the Colossians, he tells them that uh, there was this guy named Epaphras. Epaphras was a companion of Paul, who uh, was what he was writing about in Colossians, and apparently this Epaphras had a great zeal for them and for them in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. So apparently he was somebody who was serving these three churches in Laodicea, Hierapolis, and Colossae. So these three churches that were in a similar region together. Um, were planted by people who Paul ministered to when he was in Ephesus. So Paul is actually coming out of prison in Caesarea when he writes this, and he's about to go to Rome. And he's writing them back about guys who apparently had been busy planting other churches since Paul's been gone. Paul's been gone for a few years now. And one of those is in Hierapolis. 
Well, Hierapolis is where this Papias was, was a bishop. And Papias of Hierapolis um, is one of the probably most famous writers from the immediate century after the churches. He wrote in probably between 120 to 140 BC. Um, he would have been contemporary with John. He knew John personally. Um, we have from other... We have te testimony from a guy named Irenaeus that he knew John and Polycarp. And Irenaeus was actually somebody who sat under Polycarp's teaching for a time. So he probably would have gotten this from Polycarp. He didn't know John himself, but he knew Polycarp. And according to Polycarp, uh, Papias knew Polycarp and John personally. So he was um, considered a faithful steward of, of the, the teachings of the apostles. And uh, he, was, he would have been um, probably installed as a bishop by either John or Timothy. Because Timothy would have been governing that region, or or perhaps as Epaphras and these guys who um, govern, you know, the churches from Ephesus and that region around Ephesians. Because these guys would have planted these churches and eventually installed elders, and Papias was apparently one of them. Well, Papias wrote five books, and he wrote a lot. He wrote on what the apostles taught. He wrote on the end times. He wrote on a lot of stuff. Unfortunately, most of his books, um, we only have fragments of them because we don't have any good copies left of them. But we know about them from Irenaeus and Eusebius, which were two prolific authors. Eusebius wrote a book called um, The Church History. Um, he wrote a book just called The Church History from uh, Christ to Constantine. So Eusebius was writing around the 4th century, um, 325 AD, so about 225 years after John the Apostle died. And he is writing really for the emperor. Um, as Christianity is getting legalized to give the emperor essentially a history of the church. Um, and then Irenaeus wrote around 180 um, AD. So he's going to write about 150 years before this. And he, again, he knew Polycarp who knew Papias personally. So we've got pretty good witnesses that these people knew this guy and that he knew the apostle John personally. And the things that we know that he wrote based on fragments that we have and based on reports from these other people say that he believed in a literal millennium. Um, they don't really get into the rapture, but they believed in the resurrection of the dead. And everything that he taught was essentially orthodox. Well, this guy has this to say about the order of the apostles were written. Now, mind you, he knew John the apostle personally. So if anyone knew when Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written, it would be John because he wrote the fourth gospel. And this is what Papias says. He says, a tradition regarding Mark, who wrote the gospel, which he, Papias, has given in the following words. This is in, um, apparently, Papias' own fragment. He says, and the presbyter said this. So Papias is considered a presbyter, or that, that would be a word for like, a, like an elder in a church. And he said, Mark, having become the interpreter of Peter, wrote down accurately whatsoever he remembered. So in other words, Peter said something. And Mark remembered it. Now I'm going to show you another source that says Peter wrote this. And then after Peter died, Mark wrote down what he remembered Peter saying because the Romans kept asking him to. Okay. So it says it was not, however, in exact order that he related the sayings or deeds of Christ. For he had neither heard the Lord nor accompanied him. But af afterwards, as I said, accompanied Peter who accommodated his instructions to the necessities of his hearer. So in other words, think of Mark like Timothy is to Paul, or Luke is to Paul. He's following him around, he's writing for him, he's serving him. Okay. And he says, but with no intention of giving a regular native narrative of the Lord's saying. So in other words, he's writing down what Peter said, but what he's saying is, Peter didn't say all these things exactly in order. Now you find that, that's what Luke says, that Luke is exactly in order. And we know that Matthew is a compilation of Christ's teachings. Mark is a summary of Matthew. And Luke is exactly in order, which is why you'll find things in Luke 17, Luke 12, and Luke 21 that are all smashed together in Matthew 24. And you'll find things that Jesus says throughout the book of Luke that are all smashed together in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew was meant to be a summary of Jesus' teachings by theme. It was not meant to be a perfect chronological account of the events happening. It was basically chronological 
but they took opportune times to take a bunch of teachings by theme and put them together, which is why you have the Sermon on the Mount being one, one big long teaching, and you have the, um, the kingdom parables all smushed together as one teaching, but you'll find them scattered throughout Luke. You have all the eschatological passages pushed together in the Olivet Discourse, but you'll find them scattered through, throughout Luke. Because Luke says right in the beginning, if you read it, and if you understand what Luke is saying, you'll know he's talking about Matthew not being in perfect order, and so his is being in perfect order. So he says, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of things which are most surely believed among us, even as they were delivered them unto us from from the beginning, which were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. So he's talking about what pre-exists when he writes Luke. Okay, notice he says many. So in other words, this can only mean one of two things. Either there's many different gospels written or many people got together to write one gospel. And that's what Matthew is. He says, so many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are surely believed among us. So in other words, He's he they're setting forth in order the doctrine that's believed among them. It's not meant to be a perfect narrative of everything in order that it happened. It's meant to be an order or an orderly presentation of Christ's teachings. That's why it says it's an order in in order, a declaration of those things most surely believed among us. So they take all of Christ's teachings on what it means to um be a believer living in the new covenant. And they put them together in Matthew 6 through through or 5 through 8. Okay. Then he takes all the kingdom parables and puts them together in Matthew 13. Then he takes all the eschatological parables and puts them together in Matthew 24 and 25. So that's what he means by a declaration order of those things believed among us. Because the main things that were taught by Christ is one, how we're supposed to live, two, what is this church age thing we're talking about? And three, the second coming. And those are the main things. And there's other things that are in there. Um, but you can tell it's clumping them together by the order of the theme that they belong to. And that's what he's talking about. So he says, many, that would be the many apostles, because all the apostles got together for the writing of Matthew, have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. So in other words, Matthew is an orderly declaration of the things that are believed among all the apostles. Even as they delivered them unto us, so who, who's them that delivered them unto us? He said, which were from the beginning eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. He's talking about the apostles, the 12 apostles and the 70 apostles who were all there from the beginning. And those were the people who were there from the Galilean ministry up until Christ was taken up in the clouds. They all got together and they wrote Matthew. And that's why they have to set up deacons in the book of Acts because they're too busy praying and studying the scriptures to come up with Matthew. They're remembering what Jesus said. So now Luke is going to talk about what his writing is. He said, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first. So in other words, he's now talking about the chronological order of these things taking place. So he had, what he did is he went, went around and he interviewed all these eyewitnesses. And remember, Paul got his gospel directly from Christ. Luke is, is, believed in the early church to be a representation of the gospel that Paul preached, which he got directly from Christ, which then Luke goes around getting eyewitness accounts to have two witnesses to all the things that Paul is saying in order. So he says, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, he's talking about chronology, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Well, who is Theophilus? That's a good question. I believe Theophilus is the person who is getting Paul's legal case. And what Luke is doing is he's writing this composition together to tell you why Paul's in Rome under trial before Caesar. So Theophilus might be Caesar, or he might be some um, administrator of Caesar who's in charge of processing all these cases and knowing why these guys are before the Caesar. So Caesar has been given a report by some Roman official as to here's this guy Paul and he's appealed to Caesar and now we have to know why he's there. And so what what um, Luke is doing is he is giving a careful under, understanding of the, the ministry and resurrection of Christ and then the ministry and activities of Peter and Paul leading up to Paul's um, presence in Rome. 
That's what Luke and Acts are. And these were originally published as a pair. They're both together. Okay. So he writes these things, which I believe this Theophilus is a Roman official who has to read Paul's case and understand why Paul is in Rome. Okay. So he says that thou might know uh, the certainty of those things wherein thou has been instructed. So in other words, he's already been told verbally or by letter from some Roman official why Paul's there. Now he's giving a more complete account of why Paul's there from Luke, who is Paul's companion, with all these eyewitness accounts. So, that's why Luke's written. Now he says, regarding Mark, wherefore Mark made no mistake in thus writing some things that he remembered them. In other words, Mark remembered as well as he could, he made no mistakes in writing them. For of the things he took a special care not to omit anything that he had heard, and not to put anything fictitious into his statements. In other words, he, he recorded exactly what Peter said. This is, this is what is related by Papias regarding Mark, but with regard to Matthew, he has made the following statements. Matthew put together the oracles of the Lord in the Hebrew language, and each one interpreted them as best as they could. But notice what he's saying, the oracles. Matthew is more, more focused on the teachings of Jesus, while Mark is more of a summary of what Jesus did. See, Peter is telling the story of what he saw and heard from Jesus, where Mark is a compilation of Jesus' teachings. Okay? So, he said, Matthew put together the oracles of the Lord in the Hebrew language. Now, there's some contention on whether they meant Aramaic or whether they meant Hebrew, because we know Jesus spoke Aramaic. We know his Galilean apostles spoke Aramaic. But we know the Jews in Jerusalem spoke Hebrew. And so did Paul, and they spoke to them in Hebrew in Jerusalem in the book of Acts. So it could have been Hebrew or Aramaic or both. And then he says, and each one interpreted them as best as they could. And what I believe this means is that Matthew was originally written probably in Hebrew because it would have been overseen by James, and the genealogy of Jesus would have been gotten from James, who was Jesus' brother from the same father, and um, then it was interpreted probably in Greek and Aramaic right away. So this Gospel of Matthew was probably written within the first decade after Christ died. And it was probably immediately copied in Greek and Aramaic because that's where all the 12 tribes were scattered. Everywhere the 12 tribes were scattered just about spoke either Greek or Aramaic. So that's what they would have been copied in. Because this was meant to be Christ's teaching to spread abroad to everybody else. And we know that these apostles went as far as Spain to India, all the way up into the Ukraine, and all the way south into Ethiopia. And in all these places, they spoke either Greek or Aramaic or both. So, that's what Matthew was. Matthew was the gospel. It was the only gospel, probably for about the first 30 years. Okay? And we also know that most of these apostles died by the 60s. John was the only one of the 12 still living after the 60s. So we know if they're going and traveling abroad to preach the gospel, and they're taking any summary of, of Christ's teachings with them, it would have been Matthew. So Matthew would have been around. And then we know that Mark and Luke were both published from Rome. Now, Luke was probably written first, but it was published later, because Luke, remember, was in use as Paul's testimony before it became published as a gospel. Mark was written right after Peter died, so we know right after Peter and Paul died, Luke and Mark were probably published very shortly afterward. And then, of course, John is written probably about 20 years after that, maybe 15 years after that. That's what Eusebius of Caesarea is saying that Papias said. Remember, Papias knew John personally, okay? Now we have what Irenaeus says. Irenaeus, who um, knew Polycarp, who knew Papias, says this about what Papias said. He says, the Gospel of Matthew was written to the Jews. So if it was written to the Jews, remember, Matthew was written before the Gentiles started being evangelized. It was written to the Jews, and it was written to the places where the Jews were spread abroad, but it was written to the Jews. They, they didn't fully understand that they were supposed to evangelize the Gentiles too by the time Matthew was written which is why you have almost nothing about the Gentiles in Matthew. But when you read Luke, you find Jesus talking about the Gentiles immediately 
in the book of Luke. Well, they don't know that. Before before Peter starts converting Gentiles later on, they don't really know that. And so they probably had Matthew written and were starting to transmit it before they even really realized they were supposed to go to all the Gentiles as well. So he says, the gospel of Matthew was written to the Jews, for they laid particular stress upon the fact that Christ is of the seed of David. Matthew also, who had a, a greater desire to prove this, took particular pains to afford them convincing proof that Christ is of the seed of David. Therefore, Matthew begins with his genealogy. That's why Matthew has the genealogy of David. Luke has the genealogy of Mary back to one of David's other sons, Nathan, while Matthew has the genealogy back to Solomon, who was the um, basically the royal line. So he needed to be from David by the flesh, which is why Mary, his mother, his, if, he, if Jesus has physical bodily flesh, it came from Mary, his mother, even though he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, he still had a physical body, and the materials from that body came from his mother. So he had to be of David according to the flesh, and so Mary's body um, was descended from Nathan, David's youngest son, and um, his, uh, uh, his um, legal lineage was from Solomon through Joseph. So then this is uh, also by Irenaeus. He said, Matthew, Matthew also issued a written gospel among the Hebrews in their own di dialect, and each one interpreted them as best as they could. So that's the original consensus. That's what we have from the oldest testimonies on the subject was that Matthew was written first in Hebrew to the Jews. And there's some people that argue what they meant by the Hebrews dialect was Aramaic, because that's what the Jews spoke. But Aramaic was actually the common person's dialect around Jerusalem. Um, so it would have been like the Galilee region, they would have spoken Aramaic. But in Jerusalem itself, they would have still spoke Hebrew, which is why you're going to read in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 40, he says, And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, Men, brethren, and fathers, hear my defense, which I make now unto you. Now remember, Paul was a scholar of Hebrew. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was trained in the Hebrew language. Okay, and it said, And when they heard that he spoke in the Hebrew tongue, they kept more silence. Okay, they were impressed that he spoke Hebrew because not a lot of people still spoke Hebrew. Only the Jews in Jerusalem spoke Hebrew because remember, most of the Jews had been scattered abroad. Most of the uh, tribes of Israel had been scattered abroad. And those who came back under the uh, Persians came back to the city of Jerusalem. They didn't repopulate all of Israel. They came back to the city of Jerusalem. And most of the people in the surrounding regions would pick up Koine Greek or Aramaic, because Aramaic was the main uh, trade language in the Middle East, and Greek was the main trade language throughout the world. So that's what most people spoke. And then if you were educated, you're an educated Jew, you also spoke Hebrew. So we know that it says, according to Irenaeus, which he says, Papias says this, that Matthew was written to Hebrews in their own dialect. And it says, while Peter and Paul were preaching at Rome, or while Peter and Paul, Paul preached at Rome, it doesn't necessarily mean at the same time they were at Rome. What he's saying is Matthew was written to the Jews while Peter and Paul preached at Rome. So in other words, one was to this audience, while Pete, or Mark and Luke were to a Roman audience. And I believe the Roman audience of Luke was originally Caesar's. Um, it actually says here that um, regarding Mark, and again, this is from Papias, it says, Having become the interpreter of Peter, Mark wrote down accurately whatever he remembered. However, he did not relate the sayings or de deeds of Christ in an exact order. So the order of Mark is, is the same order as Matthew. They're very similar in order. They're not going to have all the same details because Matthew is, Matthew is a compilation of Christ's teachings while Mark is a summary of what Christ did. And it's given by Peter, and so it's mostly going to focus on things where Peter was there and what he saw and heard. Okay, so there's going to be some things that are additional in Mark, and that's because all the other apostles might not have heard or saw that thing, but Peter did. So when you put down Mark, or when you put down the Gospel of Matthew, you got to have stuff that multiple of these guys heard Jesus say. So if just Peter heard this, it's not going to go in Matthew. 
And what they focused on mostly is where, when Christ taught many disciples publicly. But Peter's going to have some additional tidbits related to his own failures when he uh, denied Christ. He's going to have additional details related to some of the sayings of Christ and things that he was there. But Peter doesn't start his gospel until after the baptism of John. And the reason is, is because Peter didn't, didn't follow Jesus until after the baptism of John. According to the Gospel of John, it was John and Andrew, his brother, that went and fetched Peter to come follow Jesus in the first place. And they were disciples of John before, so they go back further than Peter did. It says, now, Peter accommodated his, his instructions to the necessities of the hearers. In other words, he's telling them what they needed to hear. But remember, Matthew was already in publication. So he's telling an eyewitness account of what he saw to the Romans. Remember, the Romans first heard the gospel from Peter at Pentecost. So when Peter got to Rome, it would have been an honor for everybody to hear from him, from his own mouth, about Jesus. And that's what he did. So he says, Accordingly, Mark made no mistake in thus writing some things as he remembered them. For one thing, he took special care not to omit anything that he had heard and not to put anything fictitious in the statement. So in other words, he, he wrote down what he remembered. He didn't omit anything, and he didn't add to it. But he wrote down as best as he could exactly what Peter said, okay? Which is why there's no ending on Mark. Because if Peter didn't give that ending orally, let's say he got executed before he gave it, Mark wasn't going to write it down. And that's why somebody else had to add it, who was also an eyewitness. Then it says, after their departure, Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, also handed down to us in writing what, what had been preached by Peter. That's Irenaeus. So we got Eusebius and Irenaeus saying the same thing. Mark, the interpreter and follower of Peter, begins his gospel narrative in this manner. Mark was a follower of Peter. Peter publicly preached the gospel at Rome. I'm sorry, this is a third witness now. This is um, Clement of Alexandria. Now, if you know where Alexandria is, that is where Mark was traditionally martyred. So this is where Mark would have been famous. And this is in 195 AD. So this is about 100 years after John the Apostle died, and this is in the place where Mark was martyred. He says, Mark was the follower of Peter. Peter publicly preached the gospel at Rome before some of Caesar's equestrian knights and adduced many testimonies to Christ in order that nearby they might be able to commit to memory what was spoken by Peter. Mark wrote entirely what is called the gospel according to Mark. Okay, so the gospel according to Mark is Mark's written account of what Peter said before uh, Caesar's equestri equestrian knights at Rome. We know Paul was preaching to the palace guard, and we know some of these guys got saved, and apparently Peter preached to them. It says, Such a ray of godliness shone forth on the minds of Peter's he hearers that they were not satisfied with a single hearing or with an unwritten teaching of the divine proclamation. So with all manner of entreaties, they pleaded with Mark, to whom the gospel is described, he being the companion of Peter, to leave in writing a record of the teaching that had been delivered to them verbally. And they did not let the man alone until, until they prevailed upon him. In other words, they kept pestering him until he agreed to write a copy of what Peter, Peter had said. And so to them we owe the scripture called the Gospel of Mark. On learning what had been done through the revelation of the Spirit, it is said that the Apostle was delighted with the enthusiasm of the men and approved the composition for reading in the churches. Clement gives the narrative in, in the sixth book of Sketches, Eusebius citing Clement of Alexandria. So apparently this is Eusebius citing this Bishop of Alexandria. So you have two of these witnesses that are less than 100 years after the Apostles tracing these narratives back to people who would have heard the apostles again mark was mark was martyred so according to church tradition mark was the first bishop of the church in alexandria and clement of alexandria would have been about 130 years later okay so this is apparently the church that mark founded and this is their account of when and how and what circumstances Mark was written. And they say Mark copied what he heard Peter say for the Romans because the Romans asked him to. 
and this would have been in 64 AD, which was when Peter died, which is when Paul died under Nero. So we have probably, Matthew is probably written somewhere in the 40s AD, and it's been around for a little while. Then Mark and Luke are written in 64 AD. They're published, or Luke is written in probably 62, but published in 64. Mark is published in 64, and then John is published probably around 80 AD um, in the region of Ephesus. So that tradition, again, prevailed in the church. Nobody questioned it because we have eyewitnesses that were so close to the original authors. We have people that knew Luke, that knew John, that knew Mark, who passed these stories on, and, and, and they were written down within 100 years of that. There's not enough time. One is, you'd have to assume that these, these early bishops of the church were dishonest people, and what incentive do they have to make this stuff up? But two is, you have three different accounts, and they're all similar. You've got, you've got what, what we have from Papias, and you've got what we have from, uh, apparently, the church that Mark started, saying that he Peter preached in Rome and Mark wrote it down. We've got from Papias and uh, basically the early tradition that Matthew was written first in Hebrew language, so we have two witnesses of that. And then we've got from, um, let's go to the Gospel of Luke now. Says Luke also, the companion of Paul, recorded the gospel in the book. So he recorded Paul's gospel in a book. He himself clearly shows that Luke was inseparable from Paul. He was his fellow worker in the gospel. So this is Irenaeus. This is the same guy who knew Polycarp. And remember, Polycarp is the bishop of Smyrna, which was planted by Ephesus, which is where Paul taught. Um, Irenaeus, is, uh, he had studied in Smyrna. But um, by the time he's writing this, he's a bishop of Lyons in France. And it says, By the style of his writing, Luke may be recognized both to have composed the Acts and the Apostles and to have translated Paul's epistle to the Hebrews. This is Clement of Alexandria, the same guy who talked about Mark. He believed that Luke wrote Luke, wrote Acts, and translated Paul's epistle to the Hebrews. The third book of the gospel is, is according to Luke. Now, he himself did not see the Lord in the flesh, which is what Paul is saying. He didn't see it. Or that's what Luke is saying. He didn't see it. He collected the eyewitness testimonies from those that did. And he, according as he was able to accomplish it, began his narrative with the birth of John. Moreover, the Acts of the Apostles are comprised by Luke in one book because these different events took place when he was personally present. The principle on which he wrote was to write only what fell under his own notice, and he shows this clearly by the omission of the martyrdom of Peter and also of the journey of Paul when Paul went from the city of Rome to Spain. Now, there's there's a theory that Paul went, went to Spain anyways. I don't believe Paul went to Spain, but some people believe he did. So this is a, this is a Miratorian fragment. So this was an early... Um, an early document in the church that was from around 280. That's what that says. And then this is Tertullian. This is in 207. Um, so this would have been about 30 years after Irenaeus. It says, Now of the authors whom we possess, uh, Marcion seems to have singled out Luke for his mutilating process. He's talking about a Gnostic who is attacking the gospel. And he says, Luke, however, was not an apostle, but only an apostolic man. He was not a master, but a disciple. So what we have basically from all these guys is that Luke wrote down Paul's gospel. And what we have from Luke's own testimony in there is that he went and got in order everything as, as they were, which is why you have all these um, details in Luke about who was king here and who was high priest here and all these details when John preached, when, when, jo when um, John's mom got pregnant with him, when John began his ministry, when Jesus uh, was born, when... Um, Jesus began his ministry all the way up to when Jesus was crucified and who was in charge then. Luke is very careful to know who's in charge in what official offices, whether they're a king or a priest or a Roman governor. And he does that all throughout the book of Acts as well because it's a legal testimony. He wants to make sure to know who was in charge and who said what so somebody can go back and verify what he wrote as being true. Okay, So again, this is, this is my theory and summary of, of the three Gospels. Based on this, this information that I have access to, based on what's, what's in the earliest church tradition, 
Matthew was written first, first to the Jews, and then it was probably copied in Greek and Aramaic pretty quickly after that. Um, so, so by the time Mark and Luke are written, Matthew is probably in publication in Hebrew, which was probably lost forever. Um, Aramaic, which there is an Aramaic version of it, but it's probably not the original. It was probably copied from the Greek and then um, in Greek. So again, my theory on all of this is, is this. Matthew was written first in Hebrew. It was written before they were expecting to evangelize the Gentiles, which is why it doesn't mention much of that. Um, th they assumed what Christ meant by go to all the nations, which was to go to all the nations where the Jews are scattered abroad. So most of those places where the Jews were scattered abroad were uh, in Greek and Aramaic. And so Matthew was copied into Greek and Aramaic, probably copied into Greek first and then from Greek to Aramaic. And, that's, and that was probably all done before Mark and Luke were published. Then Mark and Luke, Luke would have been, um, the notes for it would have been taken while, while Luke was in prison in Caesarea. So it would have been a second witness based on eyewitness testimony of Paul's gospel for Paul's legal trial. Mark was a testimony of what Peter would have preached to the Romans, probably in several sessions. I doubt that he just recited all that in one setting, but Luke, Mark was what would have written down after the fact what Peter said in Rome up until the point Peter died. That's what I believe. That's why long that's why Mark doesn't have a, a resurrection account at the end because Peter died before it was done. Luke would have been published after Paul was dead. And then John was written afterwards. And then like I said, we have from Greek testimony that this guy named Aristion, who was one of the seventy that are mentioned in Luke, um, he added the ending to Mark to put a resurrection account at the end of it. So that's what we have. And long story short is I trust our Bible. I trust our Bible in the order it was written, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, we know the other epistles aren't in order, but they weren't meant to be. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were meant to be in order. So um, I hope this is helpful to you guys because, again, it's not just the scholarship of knowing when they were written, but it's to be able to defend against the Markan um, hypothesis or the Markan priority hypothesis is really defending the gospel itself because the people who are saying that want you to go a step further and say the long ending of mark is not is not legitimate and that's what has the resurrection and then they want you to go one step further and say there's a q gospel that had none of the miracles and none of the resurrection that matthew mark and luke were all drawn from and it's a shame but what we're seeing in these scholarly circles is a systematic attempt to uh eliminate the gospel is what you're seeing and put complete doubt in in the uh legitimacy of your bible so remember if these gospels weren't written by eyewitness accounts and they all were then we don't have a legitimate gospel at all and we have to believe the tradition that was handed down to us because this is what was told by the people who knew the apostles personally now these guys aren't right on every little doctrine and every little interpretation but i think we can trust that you know they they knew who wrote these these books and when and why they were part of the canon to begin with because it had to have been somebody after the apostles who knew what was written by the apostles in order to canonize it as the apostles teaching and they all also said that that paul wrote hebrews but again paul was dead by the time hebrews was delivered so there's no salutation from paul because he's dead you don't salute somebody if you're if you don't exist he's dead so he's not saying hello it's just his teaching nor is he saying, send my greetings to so-and-so, because he's dead. So that's the same reason why you don't have long ending on Luke. That's the same reason you don't have Paul's name on Hebrews. It was written by Luke, based on what Paul taught, and sent to the Hebrews. And that's why you have some notations that seem to think that it wasn't written by an eyewitness, because it's written by Luke. Just like Romans was written by another guy, and his name is mentioned in it, even though he's recording what Paul is saying. Because Paul didn't write too great. If you remember, he signed his own writings. But when he was in Galatia, he had a bunch of rocks thrown at his head. So he couldn't see too well, which means he couldn't write too well. So he had other people writing for him. So anyways, I hope you guys are blessed by this teaching. I hope it allows you to defend against, um, again, the modern scholars who are going to try to make you doubt your Bible. And I hope you guys stay strong in the faith until the end. In Jesus' name, peace out. Peace, I'm out. I'm Batman.